In this video, we're going to continue talking about classes and objects, but this time I want to focus in on how classes are used within the .NET framework, which occasionally might look a little different from the example that I demonstrated in the previous lesson. Now, my goal at the outset was not to teach you everything that you need to know to become an object-oriented programming master, but rather so that you can understand the basics of working with classes in the .NET Framework class library. And to do that, I demonstrated it using uh, a very simple class, uh, creating a class, creating an instance of the class, and then setting properties on the class. And in the previous lesson, I used a very concrete example, that of a car class. A car is easy to conceptualize and easy to represent in a class. After all, we all know what a car is. And so it's easy also to think about it in purely physical terms. The fact that it has four wheels and it has a make and a model and a color and a year it was produced and so on. However, as you begin to build applications, especially in this series of videos, you'll typically not be responsible for creating your own custom classes like we did. As you come to understand more about how to use custom classes in your application, well, they do provide some incredible benefits, but for now, I think your main exposure to classes will be those classes that are created by Microsoft in the .NET Framework class library. Specifically, that portion of the base class library that's concerned with Silverlight and the Windows Phone 7. Now, unlike the car class that I created, the .NET Framework class library classes often do not have real-world equivalents. For example, I might work with a class that represents a connection to the Internet, or I might work with a class that represents a stream of data, which is sort of like a pipeline of data that flows from one place to another. In both of those cases, it's difficult to draw a parallel to the real physical world. Uh, in these cases, I recommend that you begin to think about classes in the .NET Framework class library as simply containers for methods. For example, we looked at the date time class in an in, uh, in earlier video today. In the physical world, we may not think of a date time as a class. We don't think of a date time as having attributes or actions. It's just What's today's date? What's the time? But within the .NET framework, it makes sense to have a now property. It makes sense to have methods that know how to properly format the date and time, and so on. So this is why I think it helps to just think of classes in the .NET framework as bundles of related functionality. You access that functionality by creating a new instance of a class in the base class library. And then you can access the properties and methods that are all related to it. Okay? In the case of the car and the date time class, we were able to use the new operator, which I compared to a factory that can create a new instance of a given class. And then once we have a new instance, uh, that object, we can begin to work with it within our code, just like we did in the previous lesson. Now, unfortunately, that's not always true. Some classes in the .NET Framework class library are known as static classes, meaning that you don't have to create a new instance of the class before using its properties or methods. We've been using the string class up to now. Uh, for example, uh, string is static when I use it like this, string.format. I didn't have to create a new instance of string. I can just use the format method by referencing it using the dot notation. Why not? Because string in this case is defined as a static class. So here's another example that will be featured on day three. Don't worry about what this is doing at the moment. Just look at the way that we get in reference to an instance of the isolated storage settings object. Isolated storage settings, settings, equals new? No, I don't use the new operator here. Instead, I go isolated storage settings dot application settings. So in this case, an instance of isolated storage settings has been created by the core CLR as we execute our Silverlight app application on the Windows Phone 7. We can get a reference to the isolated storage setting object by accessing its application settings property. So this might look a little bit strange based on what we said in the previous lesson, but that kind of typifies some of the various ways that you're going to wind up working with classes and objects in your applications. So the big question is this. How do you exactly figure out the correct way to use a class that's defined in the .NET Framework class library? 
Well, there's a couple of clues. You can I use IntelliSense a lot to help me figure out what I should be doing, uh, how I should be using a given class uh, or object within the framework class library. And then there's that little help window that often pops up. Uh, I can hover my mouse cursor over it or whenever I'm selecting a given uh, object or, or method of an object inside of the uh, inside of IntelliSense, it'll pop open that little help window off to the right-hand side. But if I'm being completely honest, I would say that I keep MSDN open, uh, the website msdn.microsoft.com, the help, uh, when I'm seriously writing code. And fortunately, there are a lot of good examples on MSDN. If I can't find a good example of what I'm looking for there, uh, then or at least if I can't find something that points me in the right direction, then I start looking at websites, at forum posts, at a book that I might own, or even videos. So this will help me better understand a part of the .NET Framework base class library that I might not yet be familiar with. But once you get more experience, you'll be able to quickly say to yourself, ah, I get it. It's just like something I've done before. It's It's not it's not all that different from these things that I've done in the past. And so uh, you'll think to yourself, well, this is no problem. I can make that equivalent uh, connection in my mind. And so like most things in life, writing software becomes easier the more and more that you do it because you'll have more experiences to draw from. Uh, sure, you might have to struggle sometimes, but it's something that every programmer has to go through to some extent. Okay, so we've talked about how the .NET Framework class library doesn't always have real-world equivalents, and how we should regard classes as containers for related functionality. And just now we spoke about different ways to access new instances of classes, or using static classes that don't require us to create a new instance first. Now I want to talk about one more way that we can create instances of classes in Silverlight applications. And so I hinted at this a few times already, and so you're probably not that surprised that things like text blocks and buttons that we've been using in our applications up to this point are indeed classes. But just to be clear, when we dragged and dropped a button or a text block from the, from the toolbox to the designer, we were no longer working with a class, but rather we were working with an instance of that class. Remember, a class is a blueprint. The class definition uh, in the case of the text block or the button, uh, at least as far as uh, the Windows Phone 7 uh, text blocks and buttons are concerned, are buried deep within compiled code that Microsoft wrote for Silverlight and for the Windows Phone 7. So we're not going to be able to just pop in and look at the source code, uh, the definition for the classes that they created, at least not very easily. But you can see uh, the code that is used to create an instance of the button and any other controls that are added from the toolbox to the XAML designer. So as you can see here in Visual Studio, I have a, a project open called Create a Button. And uh, I call your attention to how I created a new instance of the button control. Uh, what you're looking at here is XAML. We haven't spent a lot of time, or any time actually, talking about this uh, up to this point, but it will come front and center here within the next couple of videos. But the way that I created a new instance of this button control was to define it here within XAML, which looks a lot like XML or HTML. So what I have highlighted here is actually creating a new instance of the button control class. It's giving it a name of button one. So now I can reference it in my code. It's setting properties of the button control, just like we did on the car. Now, admittedly, it looks different from what we did in the previous lesson because the syntax of XAML is different than the syntax of C-sharp. So you might be wondering to yourself, hey, can you actually create a button in C-sharp? Absolutely. Let's take a look at the main page .xaml.cs. First of all, notice that I have a click event for this button. And so this application is pretty simple. When you click that button, it's going to dynamically at runtime create a new instance of the button class and add it to the phone. All right, and it won't do much. I'm not going to hook up um, a, a, a click handler for this new button that I'm going to create. I could do that. I just didn't take the time to do that in this example. But as you can see here, 
this looks very similar to the syntax that we used in the previous lesson when we created a new instance of the button control. Here we have, uh, I'm sorry, of the car class. Here we have the button class, my new button equals new button. Here we have the new operator. Now we start setting properties of our button uh, instance. And then finally, we're going to, uh, we're, we'll talk about containers and about the content grid later, but we need to add this button to the interface so it's actually visible. And that's what we do in this final line of code in line 35. So let's run the application just to demonstrate how this works. And when I click the button, we've created a new instance of the button at runtime and displayed it to the user. Now again, it won't do anything. Okay, we could remedy that situation, but I just wanted to make the point that there's more than one way to create a new instance of a class that's been defined in the .NET Framework class library. One way is through our C# -sharp code using a new operator, but then we can also create a new instance of certain types of classes like the button class, for example, using XAML. We're going to revisit this a lot more when we talk about XAML uh, and we give it its, its, uh, its full uh, consideration in another lesson coming up later today. All right, so I've covered a lot of ground in a very short amount of time. I'd encourage you to take all these thoughts at face value for now. Uh, just focus on the key takeaways at this point. Later, you can spend weeks or months learning everything there is to know about classes and about objects. Hopefully this is going to be enough information to help you understand the basic syntax in the coming videos when we're working with the Framework Class Library. So we'll see you in the next lesson. Thank you.